Before starting the video make sure to hit the subscribe button if you are new to my channel, it really motivates me to keep on creating anime recaps for you guys. The story starts, and the narrator explains that in Kimberly Magic Academy 20% of the students are consumed by the spell by the time they graduate. We then see our protagonist who is about to enter the academy this year, and a talking plant tells him that he seems nervous. The plant tells him to try and relax a little even though a terrible future might await him. Our protagonist thanks the plant for showing concern for him, and he thinks that this must be something that they say to scare the new kids here. He thinks that he can't be sure of this, as this is not an ordinary school. The protagonist then notices a girl who is also wondering what the plant meant by terrible future, and a red-haired boy tells her to not worry about what the pride plants say, as magi flora like them absorb magic particles from the ground which affects their personalities, and he has heard that the ones around here are particularly nasty. The girl then mentions that she doesn't know much about plants, but she does love magical fauna. The boy wonders what kind of fauna she likes, and the girl states that she likes all of them. A girl with ringlets then warns a white-haired boy to watch where he is going or he will step on a pride plant's stem, and who knows what kind of invective the plant will hurl at him. The plant states that this is rude, and the white-haired boy mentions that he didn't ask for her help. All of them then notice a samurai girl, and they think that they have never seen a samurai before. The protagonist then mentions that something about this girl made him stare at her, and he wonders if this is what people sometimes call fate. The scene then cuts to all of them enjoying a parade of magical fauna, and the red-haired guy thinks that he has never seen a dragon like that. The protagonist states that this is a Fafner, and the red-haired guy thinks that he is really knowledgeable. The protagonist mentions that he just read that in an encyclopedia, and he asks the girl from before why she seems depressed as he thought that she liked magical fauna. The girl states that she does, but they are making a troll walk in the parade like the other beasts. She thinks that this is wrong, and the red-haired guy thinks that it should be alright as the trolls don't speak their language, and the wild ones attack people. The both of them then have a heated argument about whether trolls are good or bad, and the white-haired guy tells them to stop as they are disturbing him. They then stop, and the protagonist states that they should talk about this after they have introduced themselves. The girl then tries to introduce herself, but someone uses magic on her which makes her walk towards the parade. She can't stop her legs as she is the under the influence of someone's magic, and the others chase after her. The troll then starts heading towards her, and the magic wears of when the girl is close to the troll. The troll then tries to attack her, but the samurai girl from before stops the troll. She wonders if the fallen girl can get up, but the girl states that she can't as her legs are numb. The samurai then draws her sword, and the others wonder if she is going to fight it. The ringlets girl thinks that this is suicidal, and she attacks the troll to divert its attention, but her attack has no effect on it. The protagonist then mentions that they are not strong enough to stop it by hurling spells at it, and he asks the others if they can use wind magic. They state that they can, and he asks them to use wind magic above the troll's head. The others understand, and they use their wind magic as they were told. The protagonist then uses a flute spell and the spells combine to make the sound of a dragon's roar, and this diverts the troll's attention. The samurai girl uses this opportunity to attack, and her hair color changes before the attack. Seeing this the protagonist states that this is innocent color, and the girl then defeats the troll. The girl then thanks the others for their help, and she states that the dragon's roar was intense. The scene then cuts to the entrance ceremony, and the earlier group ends up separated in the hall. The protagonist then finds out that the samurai girl didn't have a plan when she went to face the troll, and the girl states that she would have been in a bind if they didn't help her. The protagonist mentions that this was reckless, and the girl thinks that it's a good omen that someone saved her on her very first day of school. The protagonist then thinks that back there the girl's hair color changed into innocent color, and he explains that the innocent color signifies powerful mana circulation through the body, as magic particles flow easily through their crystal-like hair. The headmaster then enters the ceremony hall, and she introduces herself as Esmeralda. She apologizes for the incident earlier, and she mentions that the troll that went out of control has already been recaptured, and the injured students been treated. Esmeralda then mentions that this is the house of learning where the students will spend their next seven years, and she states that here they prioritize freedom and results. She mentions that the life and death of the students are in their hands, 
as only 80% of the students make it out of this academy alive. She explains that the other 20% are either permanently crippled or their magic goes out of control. In this world of magic, they say that these individuals were consumed by the spell, and she mentions that this is what it means to learn magic. She states that they have made it where they are today by paving their road with the corpses of the dead, and she tells them again that their life and death are in their hands. She tells them to leave something behind when they die, or there will be nothing left of them. Esmeralda then asks everyone if they have any questions, and the samurai girl tells Esmeralda that she can cure her headaches by rubbing her head in circular motion. Esmeralda wonders if this is a question, and the girl mentions that it was just an advice as Esmeralda seems to be in a lot of pain. This makes everyone laugh, and Esmeralda states that next is the welcome banquet, and she tells the students to have fun and mingle with each other. She then teleports all of them to the venue of the banquet, and the upperclassmen welcome the students there. They mention that the headmistress must have been scary, and they ask the students to forget that for now and enjoy themselves. The protagonist and his group of friends then meet up with each other, and they think that the only one left is the injured girl they took to the nurse's office. The injured girl then also shows up there, and they state that they can finally introduce themselves. The ringlets girl first introduces herself as Michaela McFarlane, and she states that she is the eldest daughter of the McFarlane family. She mentions that her family is a dignified and proud clan which has lived in South Yeldland since ancient times, and the red-haired guy states that he knew that she was a McFarlane when he saw her ringlets as everyone in her family has the same hairstyle. The injured girl then introduces herself as Katie Alto, and she states that she is an exchange student from Farnland, a union country in the north. She mentions that she likes all kinds of animals, and she thanks everyone for saving her. The red-haired guy then introduces himself as Guy Greenwood, and he states that he is from a family of magical farmers with a fairly long history. He mentions that he is quite confident in his knowledge of plants, and they can ask him for some yummy veggies anytime they want. The white-haired guy then introduces himself as Pete Reston, and he informs everyone that his parents are non-magical. Michaela states that it must have been difficult for him to get those ordinary slots for this school, and Pete states they don't need to flatter him, as he is not here to make friends with anyone. The protagonist then wonders if Pete is reading Introduction to Magic for Non-Magicals, and Pete can't believe that he recognizes this book. Pete then gets excited talking about the book with the protagonist, and the others laugh seeing this. The protagonist then introduces himself as Oliver Horn, and he mentions that his family's been magical since his grandfather's day, but right now he is living with his relatives. He states that he also has a brother and sister who are older students at Kimberley, and they are actually his cousins. Michaela then mentions that she has never seen someone create a dragon's roar with a flute spell, and Oliver states that customizing spells and coming up with new ways to use them are one of his specialties. At last, the samurai girl introduces herself as Nanao Hibia, and she mentions that she was born to a samurai family in Turukwaisen. She states that she was brought here by a strange twist of fate, because a passing mage saved her when she was about to be killed in a war. She mentions that the mage called himself McFarlane, and he invited her here. Michaela thinks that it must have been her father, and she states that he is a lecturer here at Kimberley. Pete then thinks that Nanao must have taken the exam for the ordinary students as she is not from a magical family, and Nanao states that she didn't take any exams at all. Michaela then mentions that the teachers at Kimberley have the ability to recommend one student, and her father must have recommended her. Guy then states that they should eat now that they have learned each other's names, and Nanao wonders if this roast beef is hers. Oliver states that this beef is supposed to serve six people, and Nanao thinks that she can eat the whole thing herself. Oliver then states that Nanao doesn't understand how meals are eaten here, and he mentions that he will make a plate for her. He then serves her one plate of food after another, and Nanao states that she feels like a princess. The scene then cuts to everyone sleeping at night, and Oliver wakes up, and he notices that the clock is behaving erratically due to some clock knocks. Seeing outside he thinks that it must be around 5 a.m., and it is revealed that he is sharing a room with Pete. He then goes outside the dorm, and he thinks that the mana particles are thick here. Someone then asks Oliver if something is bothering him as he is up early, and Oliver states that he just wanted to take a look around the school while it's still quiet, and he wonders who she is. The girl states that she is a covert operative sent by Gwyn, and she was asked to keep an eye on him until he is settled in.
Oliver thinks that a covert operative is a bit much even for his brother, and he then asks the girl her name. The girl states that it's Teresa Karst, and Oliver wonders if he will get to see her face one of these days. Teresa mentions that he will, and she tells him to call her anytime he needs her. Going ahead Oliver notices Nanao bathing by the fountain, and Nanao thinks that Oliver is early to rise. Oliver then uses a spell to cover that entire area, and he states that Nanao can't bathe here, as this place is in plain view of the men's dorm. Nanao mentions that she is not doing anything that people shouldn't be seeing, and she states that she is just purifying her body of the blood that it bathed in during the last war. Oliver then asks her about her scars, and Nanao states that these are from the war, and she apologizes if they are unpleasant to look at. The sight of the naked Nanao then reminds Oliver of a blonde-haired girl, and Nanao states that she forgot to bring something to dry herself with. Oliver gives her his coat, and Nanao thanks him for it. Oliver then thinks that Nanao was a strange innocent girl he met at the Kimberly Magic Academy, but she had a faint scent of blood which nothing could wipe away. The story continues, and the girls are talking with each other, and they then meet Oliver and Pete. They wonder if the boys slept all right, and Pete states that they did. Guy then comes there, and he states that he overslept as he didn't know that there were clock knocks here. The girls mention that there weren't any in their rooms, and Guy then states that the uniform looks good on Nanao. Guy then asks Oliver if his robe is a little damp, and Oliver mentions that it's not. Pete then mentions that they should hurry up and eat breakfast as their first day is packed with classes. Nanao states that she can understand Pete's excitement, and she mentions that she can't wait to find out what magic classes are like. The scene then cuts to the students attending their first period, and it's the sword arts class. The teacher Luther Garland asks the students if someone can define what sword arts are, and Pete raises his hand, and the others can't believe that Pete has already become the teacher's pet. Pete then explains that sword arts are techniques that are performed using their athemies, and the use of athemies in complement with the white wand dates back to 400 years ago, when a famous mage named Wolf Batterwell lost a duel to a non-magical. Ever since then mages have carried athemies to deal with attacks from close range. Luther mentions that this was a great explanation, and he then states that every year they start off the first day, by having two people who already know how to fight put on a duel for them, and he asks if there are any volunteers. Nanio then volunteers for it, and a student named Richard Andrews also volunteers for the duel. He mentions that he heard that Nanao defeated a troll with her sword, and he states that this is a perfect opportunity for her to show them how people in Asia fight. Seeing this Oliver thinks that Richard wants to show off that he is stronger than Nanao by taking advantage of her lack of sword arts experience, and he then volunteers to duel Nanao. Richard asks Oliver to back off as he asked Nanao first, and Oliver mentions that he already has a connection with Nanao, as they fought the troll together. Oliver then thinks that Richard was close by when the troll attacked, but he did nothing, and Richard mentions that Oliver seems to be proud that he fought the troll, but in a situation like that the smart thing would be to leave it to the teachers. Oliver wonders if this is the choice that Richard would make when a classmate is about to be crushed, and Michaela then challenges Richard to a duel. She mentions that everyone would be more impressed if he can defeat her, and Richard reluctantly agrees to this. Luther then mentions that the first duel will be between Nanao and Oliver, and the second duel will be between Richard and Michaela. The first pair then goes to the center for the duel, and Luther casts a spell called Securus on both of their swords. He mentions that this is an anti-lethality spell, and now they won't be able to injure each other. He mentions that this is the only form of combat that's allowed between the students, and the penalty for breaking this rule is harsh. Luther then informs them that the duel will end when one of them inflicts a mortal blow to the head or chest, and Oliver then thinks that Nanao doesn't know how to use magic so he will go easy on her, but he soon realizes that he can't afford to do that while fighting her. The duel then begins, and both of them lock their swords, Oliver parries Nanao's attacks, and the both of them cross swords with each other. While fighting Oliver thinks that there is no doubt that Nanao is killed with that sword of hers, and he wonders how many she has killed until now. Nanao then starts to cry in between their duel, and Oliver thinks that he wants to stop Nanao's tears by giving this everything that he has. Both of them then prepare to cross swords again, and Luther stops the duel, as the both of them have broken the anti-lethality spell. Luther then tells them to take their seats, and Michaela asks Richard how many of Nanao's attacks he could deflect. Richard doesn't say anything, and Michaela then withdraws her request for the duel, as they have seen enough fighting for the day. 
After the end of class Nanao chases after Oliver, and she mentions that this was a wonderful fight. She states that the only thing she regrets is not getting to finish it, and she mentions that she wants to see what lies beyond that moment. She then asks Oliver to fight her again with real swords, and no spells holding them back, and Oliver states that he will never fight her again, as he doesn't want to kill her, and he also doesn't want her to kill him. This makes Nanao cry, and the scene cuts to the students on a break after their classes. Michaela mentions that the spellology class was full of surprises, and we see that in the spellology class the teacher Francis Gilchrist told the students that the Athamis look unsightly, and mages have no need for anything other than their white wands. She mentioned that the students should solve all their problems with magic if they call themselves a mage, and Guy wonders what's going to happen in the afternoon classes. Katie states that next is the magical biology class, and she has been looking forward to it. The scene then cuts to the magical biology class, and the teacher Vanessa Aldis states that if anyone here loves animals, and think that they are cute then they can throw their ideals in the trash. She mentions that here they treat magical creatures as resources, and she is going to teach them how to exploit these resources. The teacher then gives magical silkworms to everyone, and she explains that these silkworms can make as many cocoons as they want as long as they supply them with magic. She states that the students need to feed the silkworm the right amount of magic, and if they give it too much then it will turn into a monster. She mentions that their job today will be cocoon making, and if they can manage to make five cocoons out of the ten silkworms she gave them, then they will pass the test. She states that they will have to deal with the monsters themselves without any help from the others, and the students then start making cocoons. Michaela manages to finish her cocoons easily, and Oliver doesn't find it difficult either. Michaela then suggests that Oliver should help Katie and Pete, and she mentions that she will help Nanao and Guy. She states that she can tell that something happened between Oliver and Nanao, and Pete then manages to make five cocoons. We then see that Katie is being really careful while making the cocoons, and Vanessa thinks that this year's freshmen are better than most. Vanessa then notices that Katie is really slow at this, and Katie tells her to let her concentrate. Katie then manages to make nine cocoons, and Michaela states that Nanao finished up, but almost all of them were failures. Michaela then mentions that Katie doesn't need to be so careful with the last one, and Oliver informs her that Katie's goal is different, and she wants to save the lives of as many living creatures as she can. The wind then breaks Katie's concentration, and her cocoon turns black, and the monster comes out of it. Katie hesitates to kill the monster, and the monster bites her, and Oliver and Michaela then take care of it. Vanessa then states that they will lose points for helping her, and the scene then cuts to Katie at the infirmary with Oliver. Katie apologizes for making Oliver leave the class with her, and Oliver mentions that he didn't want to be there anyways. Katie then tells him that her family has a bunch of animals, and she was especially close to their troll named Papra. This is why she can't take it when she sees an animal or demi-human get hurt. She knows that society needs these things to advance, but to amage everything without human rights is just a resource to exploit. She mentions that she can't accept this, and Oliver thinks that Katie's childhood home must have been like growing up among angels in paradise, but she has come to earth now, and she can't stay an angel anymore. However, if she still chooses to remain an angel then it would be a really noble thing to do, and he mentions that Katie has only seen a small part of Kimberly now, and she shouldn't hurry to make a decision about it yet. He then states that Katie is not alone in this, and we see that her friends were eavesdropping on them. Afterwards Teresa states that Oliver's first day must have been difficult, and she advises Oliver to choose his friends wisely as someone who can't even kill a single silkworm is unlikely to survive here. Oliver mentions that he can decide this for himself, and he wonders if Teresa needed something. Teresa states that she will be heading to Master Gwyn's workshop, and she wanted to let Oliver know that she will be leaving his side for a while. Oliver understands, and he asks Teresa to say hello to Gwyn. The scene then cuts to everyone finishing dinner, and Guy wonders if Katie is alright. Katie states that she is fine, but Nanao looks a bit down, and she wonders if something is worrying her. Pete then remembers that he left his book in the classroom, and he states that he will go get it. Michaela and Oliver state that they will go with him, as things that are lost at Kimberly are not easy to find. They then leave, and Guy thinks that they look tense. Katie then informs him that she has heard that this school sits atop a giant labyrinth, and at night the labyrinth starts to encroach on the school. Pete then finds his book, and Oliver thinks that they need to get back before dark. On their way back the group comes across a dead end, and the scenery around them changes. 
Michaela can't believe that the labyrinth's encroachment has already spread this far, and Oliver states that they shouldn't worry about this, as this happens all the time in Kimberley. He mentions that there should be teachers and upperclassmen patrolling the school, and someone then shows up there. They notice that it's a girl, and she introduces herself as Ophelia Salvadori, a fourth year student. Oliver also introduces himself, and he mentions that he has read Ophelia's thesis on rapid development from interbreeding krakens and scillas. He states that it gave him shivers, and Ophelia then releases something which attracts Pete towards her, and Michaela stops him. Ophelia mentions that she can't stop this as this is how her body works, and she asks them to come closer, but Oliver and the others refuse, and they try to run away, but they are stopped by another upperclassman named Cyrus Rivermore, a fifth year. He mentions that they should keep Ophelia company as she is a lonely woman, and if they don't like her then he can take care of them instead. Ophelia then mentions that she needs to discipline them for running away in the middle of a conversation, and they wonder what's going to happen to them. The story continues, and Pete tries to draw his weapon to fight the seniors, but Oliver stops him, and Michaela states that they shouldn't give them a reason to attack. Ophelia then tells Cyrus that it's been too long, and she states that it's disgusting how he desecrates every corpse he finds. Cyrus mentions that what Ophelia does in pursuit of her carnal desires are far more disgusting, and he then calls Ophelia a succubus. This makes Ophelia mad, and Cyrus mentions that Ophelia can't do anything to him as the last time they fought, he ripped out half of her guts. Ophelia then gives birth to a monster, and Cyrus summons a bone monster of his own, and two monsters fight each other. Oliver and the others try to run during this commotion, but Cyrus stops them using his bone cage, and Nana then comes there, and she states that this seems like a place where men come to die. The scene then cuts to the monsters fighting, and Nanao breaks the bone cage, and she states that she will protect Oliver and the others. She mentions that this is their chance to escape, and she states that she will join the battle, and she won't let either of them come after her friends. The battle of the monsters still continues, and neither of them give any leeway to the other. Nanao then mentions that she has finally found a place to die, and she tries to head into battle telling the others to escape, but Oliver goes to stop her. A wall of flames is then erected in front of them, and the man responsible for this states that he told them that there is a right and a wrong way to recruit new students. Cyrus recognizes him as purgatory, and the man asks him to not call him that in front of the new students. The man then introduces himself as Alvin Godfrey, the student body president at Kimberley, and he asks Oliver and the others to not worry as they are safe now. A girl named Carlos then tells Ophelia to put down her weapons, and she tells the new students that she is a fifth-year prefect. Alvin then states that he will inform Cyrus and Ophelia of their punishments later, and he asks them to go back to the depths of the labyrinth for now. Cyrus and Ophelia then leave, and Alvin mentions that those two don't usually come this far, and he thinks that they might have been curious about the freshmen. Carlos then states that they don't need to worry anymore as there are few places in Kimberley safer than being at Alvin's side. Alvin then mentions that he is impressed that they avoided being taken away, and he mentions that they aren't the only ones who got lost today. The scene then cuts to everyone out of the labyrinth, and meeting with their friends, and Katie states that she was really worried about them. Nanao apologizes, and Oliver then angrily asks Nanao if she has a death wish. He mentions that what she did inside was reckless, and he wonders why she wants to die so badly. Michaela then breaks them off, and she states that they should talk about this. The scene then cuts to Michaela asking Nana why she did what she did, and Nana mentions that she has lost her attachment to life. She states that she still doesn't feel like any of this is real, she then tells them about the last battle she fought. She mentions that their enemy, the Soma Yoshihisa, led a force of 50,000 men, and their vanguard numbered only 200. She states that all she remembers is killing, until she was in the middle of the enemy camp, and she then went to take the general's head. On her way she killed another warrior, and the general's forces then surrounded her. The general then asked her if she wants something as her last wish, and Nanao told that she would like to fight his son, the strongest warrior in their clan. The general mentions that the warrior she cut down just now was his son, and for killing his son he will grant her a swift and nameless death. He mentions that she will be forgotten to history, and before he can kill her Michaela's dad arrives there, and he saves Nanao. He mentions that he is drawn to children with potential, and he states that it would be a waste to let her die here, and he wonders if Nanao would like to come to his country and become a mage. At the present Nanao mentions that everything since then has seemed like a part of a single dream, 
and that's why she wanted to make her wish come true before the dream came to an end. Nanao then explains that her clan members are taught to feel joy when they are killed by a blade wielded with mutual love instead of revenge. She mentions that they call this Shiavase in their school of fighting, and she states that she knows that this is twisted, but when she fought Oliver she felt like this was the Shiavase that she was looking for. She knows that Oliver refused her because he has no reason to fight her to the death, but it still made her sad that he pushed her away, and at some point she stopped caring about everything else, and she just wanted to die. Katie then mentions that in short Oliver turned Nanao down, and she got weird about it. Nanao states that this is basically the case, and she mentions that it's the same whether she fell in love with Oliver's blade or him as a person. Michaela then states that she can't let them kill each other, and she wonders if a non-lethal duel is not good enough. Nanao mentions that it's not, as the style of fighting she has learned is all about killing. Michaela states that she understands, and she suggests that it's time for Nanao to find a new way to live. She mentions that Nanao should stop looking for a place to die, as there are a lot of those in Kimberly, and she states that her being alive here is not a dream. She states that it doesn't matter if she fell in love with a person or a blade, but she should be looking at the person with or without his sword. She states that everyone who was here also wants to spend their time with her, and everyone agrees with this. Oliver then asks Nanao to promise her that she is not going to try and kill herself again, and use her sword for her own sake, and Nanao promises him this. She asks them to teach her how to live her life here, and she mentions that she didn't understand a single one of the classes today. Oliver states that they will help her out, and it still isn't late for her as Pete also started learning magic recently. The scene then cuts to the group heading to their classes, the next morning, and on the way Nanao is looking at Oliver. Oliver wonders why Nanao is walking next to her, and Nanao states that she is doing this to look at Oliver, as Michaela told her to look at the person and not the sword. Oliver states that she didn't mean for her to get right up his face, and Nanao wonders if he minds it. Pete and Guy think that he doesn't seem to mind it, and Katie then tells Nanao that it's not good for her to press against Oliver like this. Nanao wonders why, and Katie can't think of an answer, and Guy and Pete then tease her over this. Afterwards at the Sword Arts class Luther wonders if anyone has any questions, and a student asks him if he can use a spellblade. Luther then explains that there is a specific type of sword art called a spellblade, and it's a technique which can kill an opponent without fail, and without any way for them to resist. He mentions that there are six spellblades in existence, and there are many who work to develop new spellblades, and many who try to invent ways to defeat the existing ones, but despite all this the number of spellblades has remained six for a long time. He mentions that these techniques are secret by nature, and how they work and who can wield them are not made public. This is why he can't tell them if he can use a spellblade or not, and a girl then wonders what will happen if two spellblade uses fight. Luther mentions that the class comes to a dead halt when that question comes up, and he then tells everyone to get back to work. Nanao then thinks that the spellblades are interesting, and she wonders if Oliver knows about them. Oliver states that his knowledge is also limited to what they just heard, and Richard then comes there and he tries to pick a fight with Oliver. Michaela intervenes, and Richard mentions that she should shut up as this has nothing to do with her, and he is talking to Oliver. Oliver wonders what Richard wants from him, and Richard states that he wants a duel. Oliver agrees, but Nanao stops him, and she states that she senses no boldness in his stride. She wonders if he is going to lose on purpose, and she mentions that she doesn't want to see him lose unless he is truly beaten. Richard can't believe that Oliver thinks so little of him, and Luther then breaks off their argument. The scene then cuts to Michaela telling Oliver that her and Andrews grew up together, and they were often compared to each other because of their similar age. She thinks that he always feared losing his place, and it's partly her fault that he is so fixated on showing his strength. Pete then comes there, and he informs them that Katie ran off when she heard that the troll who went out of control was about to be killed. The scene then cuts to Katie having an argument with the teacher who was about to kill the troll, and upon finding out Katie's name the teacher states that a lot of civil rights people are stupid, but her parents are one of the stupidest ones he has ever seen. Katie mentions that she will pretend that she didn't hear that insult about his parents if he lets this troll go, and the teacher wonders if Katie will take responsibility if the troll kills someone. Katie states that she will convince the troll to not attack anyone, and the teacher laughs hearing that Katie is going to have a conversation with a troll. He thinks that Katie needs to be educated, and he uses a spell on her which causes her great pain. Oliver and the others then come there, and Oliver recognizes the teacher as Darius Greenville. 
Michaela states that Darius is going too far, and Darius asks them to not get in his way. A fourth-year student named Vera Milligan then arrives there, and she mentions that there has been a filed objection to the death of that troll, and she states that Luther is the one who filed it. Luther then tells Darius that extreme pain spells in teaching were banned five years ago, and Darius states that he has no intention of changing the way he teaches. Darius then wonders what this objection is, and Luther mentions that they have yet to do a full investigation into the cause of what happened at that parade, and the troll should be kept alive as evidence. Darius thinks that it's ridiculous, and Luther mentions that the right advocates are becoming powerful as of late and killing the troll without inquiry will give them a lot to complain about. Darius then leaves, and Michaela uses a spell to ease Katie's pain. Vera then tells Katie that she was also concerned about the Academy's plans for this troll, and she thinks that there is a lot she can do to help Katie as a fellow demi-human lover. She states that Katie can come talk to her if she ever needs something, and later the group receives a letter from Richard saying that he wants to challenge Oliver and Nanao to a duel. The story continues with Katie trying to feed the troll, and Vera mentions that most trolls at Kimberly are used to being around people, but this one's been like this since the incident. Katie then assures the troll that she is not her enemy, and she eats the troll's food herself to show him that there isn't anything suspicious in the food. Some students laugh at Katie seeing this, and meanwhile Michaela asks Oliver and Nanao if they are sure about their duel with Richard, and Nanao states that she has no reason for turning down an honorable duel. Oliver mentions that it would be the best if they accept the challenge, as there is no avoiding conflict with him no matter how this ends. Guy then asks them when the duel is happening, and Pete tells him that it's happening on the first layer of the labyrinth tomorrow night. The scene then cuts to some students in class making fun of Katie, for going to see that troll again, and they wonder how she can stand being around such a slow and brutish creature. They mention that Katie must be just as slow, and the girl among them states that Katie should at least wash herself after seeing that thing as lately the whole classroom smells like troll. This makes Guy angry and he tries to go teach them a lesson, but Oliver stops Guy. The students then state that they also saw her trying to imitate the troll, and Katie then comes into the classroom, and the students then make fun of her saying that the world-class impersonator is here and they ask her to impersonate a troll. They then try to bully her even further, and this makes Oliver and the others angry, and Oliver attacks the students with magic. He then asks Guy how he is in a fight, and Guy and Nanao join Oliver to fight the students responsible for the bullying. The scene then cuts to Michaela meeting Guy, Nanao and Oliver in the detention room, and Nanao and Oliver mention that they have no regrets as they did defeat many of the other party's members. Michaela then mentions that she didn't expect Oliver to be the one to start this, and Oliver has no words in his defense. Katie then states that all this was her fault as she couldn't speak up for herself, and Oliver mentions that it wasn't, as his self-control was to blame for all this. Guy then states that he is satisfied with how this ended as they did insult Katie to her face, and Katie thanks them for standing up for her. Michaela then mentions she agrees with Guy. But this has made the situation worse, as most of their fellow first years are against them now, and Richard can take advantage of this at tomorrow's duel. She states that tomorrow's duel won't be a fair one, and the scene then cuts to some students guiding Oliver and his group to the duel's location. They tell them to sharpen their athemies, and everyone uses magic to sharpen them. They then head into the labyrinth, and after a while Katie wonders where they are going as they have been walking for a while. Pete wonders if they are being led into an ambush, and they all then arrive at the dueling grounds. They notice that the dueling area is a coliseum, and there are many students in the stands who are here to watch the duel. Some students then tell the participants to head to the dueling grounds, and the rest of them to take the stands. Oliver then states that there is no telling what will happen here, and he asks Michaela to protect the rest of the group, and the others then wish Oliver and Nana a luck, and they leave for the stands. The students then stop Oliver and Nanao telling them that there is going to be an exhibition battle first, and in the exhibition battle Richard fights and kills some kobolds. Nanao asks Oliver what this is, and Oliver states that this is a kobold hunt. He mentions that it's a traditional game played by mages, and rights activists have opposed this so they don't see it so often nowadays. Richard then asks Oliver and Nanao if they need an explanation for this game, and Oliver wonders what's the meaning of this as they were supposed to have a duel. Richard then states that he can't gain any honor by defeating them in a duel, as they are far beneath him, so they will instead be competing in a two-on-one kobold hunt. The side which slays the most kobolds will be the winner, and Oliver thinks that Richard is most likely doing this as he is a veteran at that game, and Nanao has never even seen a kobold until today. 
Oliver thinks that maybe it would be for the best to let Richard win and use this as a way to repair their relationship. We then see that one of the kobolds is trying to run away, but a student forces it into the arena, and it is killed by another student even though it has no will to fight. Seeing this Nanao shouts that this is enough, and she mentions that this is not fun. She states that forcing those with no will to fight on the battlefield competing to see how many of them they can kill is just despicable. This makes the audience angry, and they start throwing bottles at her, and they tell her to get out of here if she is not going to fight. Nanao then tells Oliver that they should leave here, as there is no battle worthy of their blades here. The students at the Colosseum door stop her from leaving, and they wonder if she wants them to beat the crap out of her. Nanao states that such a fight would be more to her liking. The students sending out kobolds then state that they should send out the next one, and they try to send out a kobold, but they notice that there is some other monster here. The monster inside then enters the arena, and it slays some students there. Nanao asks Oliver what this is, and Oliver states that it's a Garuda. He wonders what's it doing here, and he asks Richard if this is his doing. Richard is surprised himself to see a monster like that here, and the students then try to fight the Garuda, but they are no match for him, and the Garuda keeps slaying the students left and right. Some kobolds also attack the students at the stands during this time, and the Garuda tells the students to see how it feels to be the prey by writing it with blood. The students try to flee the arena, but the door is an opening, and Richard then tries to flee seeing that he is outmatched, and the Garuda tries to attack him, but he is saved by Nanao. Nanao then tells the Garuda that it mustn't be fun striking a foe from behind, and she asks it to fight her instead. Nanao's hair color then changes into the innocent color, and she fights the Garuda, but she can do nothing but parry its attacks. Guy then states that they should help Nanao, and Michaela states that he will only get in her way. Katie then mentions that Michaela should be able to help her, and Michaela states that she promised Oliver that she would keep them safe. She mentions that the only thing they can do right now is keep themselves safe and believe in their friends. We then see that Nanao is still fighting the Garuda, and the Garuda tries to attack her with one of its powerful moves, but Oliver pushes Nanao out of the way using his magic. This makes Oliver a target, and the Garuda then attacks him, and he tries to attack the Garuda as well, but both of them dodge the attack. The Garuda then attacks and injures Oliver, and Nanao steps in to save him. Oliver then takes some cover and he heals himself using his magic. He then notices that Richard is also hiding there, and Richard wonders how Oliver can fight. Oliver tells Richard to get to some place safe, and Richard wonders if Oliver is not scared. Oliver states that he is, but he doesn't think that Nanao is scared, as she is a true warrior, and not an ordinary student like him. He mentions that this is why he has to help her, and if he doesn't teach her about how to act like an ordinary person then she will just die. Oliver then heads out telling Richard that Nanao wanted to see how he fought, and he then helps Nanao in fighting the Garuda. He states that they can't keep this up much longer, and Nanao asks him what's the plan. Oliver states that he will make an opening for her and he mentions that she should use it to get in close and go for the kill. Nanao then fights the Garuda, and Oliver uses his magic to make an opening for her, but the Garuda recovers too quickly. Richard then uses his magic to attack the Garuda creating an opening for Nanao, and Nanao beheads the Garuda while taking some damage herself. Oliver then tells Richard that this is all thanks to him, and Richard states that this is how he fights. Nanao then mentions that the wind spell Richard used was amazing, and Richard states that he is scion of the Andrews clan so no one should be able to match his mastery of wind. Richard then states that he can also risk his life as a mage, and he mentions that he might be afraid to fight, but he is much more scared of losing and being told that he is an embarrassment to the Andrews clan. He then asks them how they can fight a more powerful foe without hesitation, and Nanao states that a samurai can't choose their foes, and once the fight has started, all they can do is believe in their victory. Oliver mentions that his thinking is not the same as Nanao, and there is no shame in running from a foe they can't defeat, but Richard held his ground while most of the students fled and he is never going to forget the courage and honor that Richard showed today. Nanao then calls Richard her comrade in arms, and she hopes that he has a bright future ahead of him, and Richard cries hearing her call him a comrade in arms. The rest of the group then meets up with Oliver and Nanao, and they are glad to see that their friends are safe. They then notice that Nanao is bleeding, and Katie states that she will heal her. Michaela then tells Richard that it's been a while since she has been able to see that wonderful side of him, and she thanks him for the sight, and Andrews then leaves. 
Later a hooded silver-haired girl comes to the bloodied arena, and she laughs at the success of her plan. The story continues, and Teresa states that she is embarrassed by what happened as Oliver's protector. Oliver tells Teresa to not worry about it if it's about the Colosseum incident, and he mentions that no one could have predicted that a Garuda would join the fight. Oliver then states that this is Kimberly, and no one can escape danger here. Teresa mentions that this is why she wants to protect Oliver, so he can do what he must when the time comes. Oliver thinks that this is true, and the scene then cuts to Katie trying to feed the troll once more. Vera thinks that Katie is really passionate about this, and she states that she would like to say that her passion would pay off, but in case of this troll, she doesn't think so. The troll then eats the food, and this makes Katie happy. Vera is surprised to see this, and the scene then cuts to the end of the student's biology class. Vanessa states that the kids should now be able to tell the difference between a Garm's guts and a Warg's guts. It is then time for lunch, and Pete thinks that he can't eat lunch after that. Guy states that he knows how Pete feels, and he mentions that he has butchered cows in his farm before, but today's class still got to him. The scene then cuts to the kids at the cafeteria, and they think that the bullies have gotten quieter ever since that last incident. Oliver then mentions that he is not sure if it's over, and he states that what happened last night was an attack on conservatives who don't want to give rights to demi-humans. Which means that this might be retaliation from demi-human rights activists for that incident where the troll attacked Katie. Oliver states that this could be a spark to ignite a war, and Pete mentions that he would feel a lot better if he knew who was behind the Garuda incident. Guy hopes that the teachers can find out about this soon, and Oliver mentions that the school won't be doing anything. Guy wonders why, and Oliver states that it's because it happened in the labyrinth. He mentions that they don't see it as anything more than a fight between the students which got a little out of hands, and Michaela states that it would be a different story if someone died, but what happened to them is quite common in Kimberly. Guy then thinks that he joined a really scary school, and Michaela states that at least Nanao has gained something important from all this. We then see that Nanao has gotten really popular with the students of her class after she slayed that Garuda, and Katie is pouting about this. Guy asks her what's the matter, and Katie states that Nanao deserves her popularity, but why isn't Oliver popular? Michaela states that she gets what Katie is saying, and she could spend an hour describing what Oliver did. Pete then states that this is understandable as Nanao's swordplay was super cool and flashy, but Oliver's spells were dull looking and difficult to understand. Guy wonders if Pete is trying to break Oliver mentally, and Michaela states that Oliver's fighting style is something that only an expert can appreciate. She then mentions that it's not right that Oliver isn't properly awarded for his efforts, and she goes to kiss him, but Oliver stops her. Nanao then comes there, and Katie explains the situation to her, and Nanao then gives Oliver a victory kiss. This makes Katie jealous, and Nanao then mentions that it's Oliver's turn now. She mentions that she also deserves a reward if it's about last night, and Oliver hesitates to kiss her, but due to her insistence Oliver tries to go for a kiss. A girl then comes there, and she can't believe that she finally met Oliver in school. She wonders if she is bothering him, and Oliver states that he never thought of her as a bother. The girl then states that Oliver has made a lot of friends, and she is glad to see this. The girl then leaves, and Michaela asks Oliver who that was. Oliver states that she was his cousin, and he has been staying with her family, and they are all kind to him. The scene then cuts to the student's alchemy class, and we see that the teacher in charge of this class is Darius. Darius then tells the students that this will be their first practical for this class, and he asks them to remember that the materials can undergo sudden and drastic changes in state, and they could be dangerous. He asks them to keep that in mind while they make their magic potions, and Oliver states that this is the fifth class they have had with this teacher after that incident with Katie. They thought that he would give her a hard time, but that didn't happen. Oliver then tells Guy that this recipe has a lot of pitfalls, and he mentions that he is going to check on him after every step. Michaela states that she will watch out for Nanao like always, and Pete mentions that Oliver doesn't have to worry about him, as he has studied a lot about this, and he doesn't want Oliver to interfere. Oliver then finishes his potion, and he notices that his classmates are making mistakes, and he goes over to them to fix their mistakes, and with this we find out that Oliver is really knowledgeable. Pete then also makes a mistake, and Oliver prevents his pot from causing a big explosion. Darius then mentions that Oliver handled all of that perfectly, and he asks him his name. 
Oliver introduces himself, and Darius states that he has never heard of the Horn Clan, so it must be new, but Oliver has a knack for this, and he will remember his name. Darius then gives Oliver a warning to choose his friends wisely, and after the class Michaela states that Oliver has finally been recognized for his talents. Pete then apologizes to Oliver for that explosion, and Richard then tells Oliver that he should be careful of Darius. He mentions that Darius takes talented students under his wing, and he ruins their future by publishing their works as his own. He states that there are all kinds of rumors about him, but none of them are good. He mentions that Oliver will probably get an invitation from him soon, but he should do his best to refuse it. Oliver thanks Richard for the warning, and Richard then mentions that an acquaintance of his wants to talk to Katie, and the rest of them, and it's about the troll incident on the first day of school. The scene then cuts to the girl who was bullying Katie apologizing to her, and she mentions that she is the one who used magic on Katie to make her walk against her will. She states that she only did it as a prank because her parents told her that rights activists are an embarrassment to mages, and she didn't know that it would get out of hand like this. Oliver then asks the girl who else was working with her to make that troll go crazy, and the girl states that she doesn't know this. She mentions that she was just trying to embarrass Katie, but the troll then went out of control. Afterwards the group wonders if they can really trust what that girl was saying, and Oliver thinks that she didn't seem to be lying. Michaela then wonders what happened to the troll to make it behave like that, and Guy thinks that this is getting complicated. Katie then states that they should think about something else for now, and she states that she will go to see the troll again, and this time, they might become even better friends. The scene then cuts to Katie feeding the troll, and she asks him what happened to him that day. She states that she knows that he is not the kind of person who would hurt somebody, and the scene changes to Oliver teaching Nanao a flame spell. Oliver states that Nanao doesn't need to rush this, and he mentions that she has to envision the spell in her mind before casting it. Oliver then shows her an example of the spell, and meanwhile Katie wishes that she could talk with the troll for real. The troll then tells Katie to not come here anymore, and Katie is surprised to see the troll talk. The troll then states that Katie should stay away from here, as that person is dangerous, and Vera is watching this from afar with a sinister look on her face. Nanao then thinks that she has a lot to learn with her wind spells as well, and Oliver tells her to take her time. Nanao states that she wants to master this spell as soon as she can as this is the first spell her friends cast together. She mentions that she wants to be able to join in the next time, and she states that she can't see that troll trying to escape again, but it's better to be prepared. Hearing this Oliver realizes that the troll didn't go out of control that day, it was trying to escape the academy, and he thinks that this is bad. He then cancels their training, and he goes to check on Katie, but he notices that she is not with the troll. The troll then states that the other one took Katie away, and Nanao is surprised to see the troll talk. Oliver then asks the troll where they took Katie, and the troll states that they must have gone to the dark and deep place where he was kept before. Oliver thinks that the troll must be talking about the labyrinth, and he then goes with Nanao to look for Katie. On the way he explains that sometime in the past rights activists organized various projects to bring intelligence to demi-humans, as they thought that demi-humans would be given rights if they were as smart as humans. One of their projects was bringing language to trolls, but the other activists criticized this project and it was abandoned, but it seems like someone kept it up. Oliver and Nano then enter the labyrinth, and Oliver states that someone must have messed with that troll's mind, and it tried to escape as it couldn't bear this anymore. Oliver and Nanao then go deep into the labyrinth, but they still can't find Katie, and Oliver states that they should contact the student council president, as going any deeper is dangerous. Oliver and Nanao are then warped somewhere else with magic, and they meet Vera there. Vera states that she can't have them call the student council president yet, and she mentions that seeing them defeat her Garuda was upsetting as it took her a lot of work to make it into her familiar. Nanao then notices Katie, and Oliver wonders what Vera has done to her. Vera states that she hasn't done anything yet, and she mentions that her operation on that troll went perfectly, but it refused to talk to her. She states that her research was at a standstill due to this, but Katie is the key, and she is going to take a look at her brain to find out how she made it happen. She states that she won't let Katie feel pain, as she has had a lot of practice. Oliver and Nanao then notice that all the tanks around them are filled with demi-humans. Nanao then asks Vera to return Katie to them, but Vera refuses, and Nanao goes to attack her, but Vera uses her eyes to turn Nanao to stone. Oliver uses his magic to prevent this from happening, 
and he recognizes Vera's eye as the basilisk eye. Vera mentions that this was a gift from her parents, and it's not something that anyone can use. She states that it killed five of her siblings before settling with her, and she mentions that those who know about this eye of hers call her Snake Eye Milligan. The story continues, and Oliver tells Nanao to be careful of Vera's eyes. Nanao then attacks Vera with her sword, but Vera is able to keep up with her, and she deflects her blows. Seeing Nanao's skill Vera thinks that the rumors about Nanao going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Garuda must be true, and Vera then uses magic to trip Nanao. Oliver then uses a flame spell to save Nanao from the next strike, and he can't believe that Vera can handle Nanao's swordplay so easily. Oliver then uses a barrier spell to hide his next attack spell, and Nanao then attacks Vera again, and they cross swords with each other. Vera thinks that it would be difficult to fight Nanao head-on, and she then uses a lightning spell to attack from a distance. Oliver then uses his magic to destroy the chemicals next to Vera which disrupts her spell, and Vera thinks that she can't let her guard down around Oliver. Nanao then comes to attack Vera, and Vera tries to use a fire spell to stop her, but Nanao attacks Vera through the spell. Vera then uses a wind spell, but Nanao uses her sword to deflect it, and Vera wonders what Nanao did just now. Oliver thinks that even Nanao might not realize what she did just now, and he can't believe that she can deflect a spell like that. Vera then states that she wants to see what Nanao is truly capable of, and she attacks her with a flame spell, and Oliver and Nanao counter it with a flame spell of their own. The spells cancel each other out, and Oliver and Nanao then try a combo move. Oliver distracts Vera by using a variety of spell, and Nanao uses this time to get behind Vera, and she tries to attack her. Oliver thinks that Vera can't use her snake eye when attacked from behind, and he then notices that she also has a snake eye on her hand, and she tries to use it on Nanao. Nanao notices the eye on her hand, and she thinks that at this rate she will be petrified before she can attack. She thinks that the curse of the snake eye travels at the speed of light, and she thinks that she must slash through the space and time around it, and she manages to do it, and she cuts Vera's hand. This makes Vera unconscious, and Oliver wonders what Nanao just did. He thinks that Nanao just severed space and time, and he thinks that speed has no meaning against that attack. Oliver thinks that this is an attack which no one can dodge, and he realizes that Nanao just used a spellblade, and she has created the seventh spellblade. Oliver then heals Vera's wounds as they have no intention of killing her, and he states that she will wake up soon. He mentions that they should take Katie to the school building now, and Nanao states that this time Oliver should give her the victory kiss. They are then interrupted by the student council president, and Oliver wonders how they found them. The president states that they received an anonymous tip about this, but it seems that they didn't need their help. The scene then cuts to the others explaining everything that happened to Katie, and Oliver states that at first Vera must really be helping Katie out of the goodness of her heart. He mentions that she must have wanted to look out for a younger girl who shared her belief, and Michaela states that this all changed when the troll began to communicate with Katie. She mentions that she can imagine how much of a shock this would have given her, and Katie wonders what's going to happen to the troll. Oliver states that the troll is a unique specimen who's successfully been given intelligence, so they won't be getting rid of him. Katie mentions that this means that it all worked out, and she then kisses Oliver and Nanao, and she states that this is her way of thanking them. She mentions that she doesn't care if the troll's brain was messed with, and if her upperclassmen tried to dissect her brain, as they did manage to stay alive through it all. She states that firstly she is going to give Vera a slap, and then she will tell her everything that's going through her mind, and then she will decide where their relationship will go from there. She mentions that she has to get used to all this, as this school is filled with people like her, and then she can change things. She states that she is going to make this school a little kinder by the time she graduates, and hearing this makes Oliver cry. Katie wonders if she said something wrong, and Oliver states that she didn't. He mentions that he just realized that he was also able to protect something, and he is glad that he protected Katie. The scene then cuts to Oliver and his friends leaving after finishing their classes, and Darius then comes to Oliver. He states that he needs to talk to him, and he invites Oliver to come see him later. Afterwards we see that Oliver and Darius are in the labyrinth, and Darius states that they are recovering a student's research. He mentions that he usually leaves this task to the others, but this student was exceptionally talented, and he was consumed by his spell. Darius states that those who are consumed by the spell always leave some kind of discovery behind, and their spirits are what propels them forward. 
Darius then comes across a monster, and he easily slays it, and Oliver thinks that this monster was even stronger than the Garuda, and he can't believe that Darius slayed it without any incantations. They then arrive at the place where the spell was cast, and Darius notices that the gate is still open. He mentions that the monsters that came out of that gate all devoured each other, and the ones they saw outside were the survivors. Darius then deactivates the spell, and Oliver then asks Darius if he already knew what was been done to that troll. Darius wonders why Oliver thinks so, and Oliver states that Darius was in a lot of hurry to get rid of that troll. He states that he also found evidence that Darius was the one supplying Vera with demi-humans, and Darius mentions that this wouldn't have been easy to uncover. Oliver then asks Darius why he was assisting Vera with her research, and Darius states that it's because his dream is to eliminate stupidity from the human race. He explains that since the dawn of humanity the society has consisted of 1% of geniuses and 99% of morons, and if he is going to change that then he needs to find a way to change human intelligence itself. Oliver wonders if he was planning to use the same surgery on humans, and Darius states that he was, but it won't be easy to get demi-human samples now. Oliver then wonders what Darius wants him to do, and Darius states that he wants Oliver to assist him. He mentions that Oliver has no talents of his own, but people like him who can do any job are valuable as assistants. Oliver then states that he has one more question, and he asks Darius what he was doing on the eighth night of the fourth month of year 1525. Darius states that this is an interesting question, and he wonders how much Oliver knows about this. Oliver asks Darius to just answer his question, and Darius mentions that Oliver must have been targeting him from the start. He states that he is surprised that the relatives of that woman are still alive, and Oliver states that he has to thank Darius for remaining the same person that he has hated for the last seven years. He then mentions that they should begin, and they both then start to fight. Oliver then sees a bunch of scenarios of their fights, but he loses in almost all of them as Darius is far better with the sword than Oliver. Oliver thinks that there must be a future where he wins, and he just has to find that future. Oliver then finds the future where he wins, and he uses the fourth spellblade to defeat Darius. Darius states that this spellblade should have died with that woman seven years ago, and Oliver mentions that there are things that they were able to take from her, and there are things that they weren't. Darius then realizes that Oliver is that woman's son, and Oliver then states that Darius must be familiar with the pain spell that reproduces pain that the caster has personally experienced. He mentions that Darius doesn't have to worry as he made sure to experience all the 128 forms of pain that he inflicted on his mother that day, and he states that he is going to torture Darius with all that pain until he finds the right words to satisfy him. Oliver then stats torturing Darius, but Darius still doesn't apologize for what he has done. Oliver keeps up the torture, and he then remembers the day when his mother was killed. In his memory we see that his mother is running away from someone, and she is then cornered by a bunch of mages. Oliver then asks Darius why he isn't saying anything, and he states that this is only the 57th one. He mentions that they are not even halfway there, and he asks Darius if he has found the right words. He states that this can't be the end of Darius Greenville the man he has hated for seven years, and Darius then asks Oliver to end him already. Oliver then kills Darius, and he tells his brother Gwyn and sister that it's over. Gwyn wonders how is the strain on Oliver's body, and Oliver states that it's the same as always. He mentions that he can handle it twice, but any more than that and he would have to be prepared to die. Gwyn then forbids Oliver from using it thrice, and he states that it will all be over if Oliver dies. He mentions that he is going to pave the way for him, and Teresa then comes there. Oliver states that she must have been the one who informed the student council about Vera, and Teresa states that she was, and she mentions that she will continue to be of use to Oliver. Gwyn then tells all of their comrades to gather, and he tells Oliver to behold his vassals. He mentions that this is Oliver's coronation, and he gives Oliver a mask. Oliver wears the mask, and he swears that he is going to kill everyone who harmed her mother. The story then goes to the past once more, and we see that a girl is guiding Oliver's mother to safety, but she betrays her mother and she slays her. We see that the girl was Esmeralda the headmistress of Kimberly, and the other killers were Demetrio Aristides, Enrico Forgieri, Francis Gilchrist, Vanessa Aldis, and Baldio Mueza Camilli. Oliver states that six of them are still remaining, and he then remembers Nanao telling him that there is no joy in a blade wielded for revenge, and he thinks that he is soon going to find out if her words were true.
The story continues, and everyone who killed Oliver's mother is having a meeting to talk about Darius. Esmeralda states that it's been four months since Darius disappeared, and she mentions that they should assume that he is dead. Francis states that he didn't seem like a fool who would let himself be killed in the labyrinth, and Enrico mentions that someone might have killed him. Vanessa states that any one of them could have done it, but the only one outside their circle who could do it is Theodore McFarlane. Theodore then greets them, and we see that he was hiding on the ceiling. Esmeralda asks him to not interrupt them, and Theodore apologizes. Esmeralda then asks them all if they had a hand in Darius's disappearance, and she mentions that if they did then they have made an enemy of her. Vanessa then mentions that this might have been done by a student, and Esmeralda states that this changes nothing, and they will regret their stupidity. The scene then cuts to Pete having a nightmare, and he wakes up wondering what that was. Pete then notices that he has changed into a girl, and Oliver asks him what's wrong. Pete tells him to not come any closer, and the scene then changes to the next morning, and Pete's friends think that he has been acting strange. Katie wonders if Guy did something to him, and Guy states that he did not, and Pete tells them to leave him alone today. Michaela then notices one of her acquaintances named Stacy Cornwallis, and she says hello to her, but Stacy ignores her, and Nana wonders if Michaela knows that girl. Michaela states that she is a relative of hers, but she has been keeping her distance since school began. The teacher then comes there, and he introduces himself as Dustin Hedges, and he mentions that he will be teaching them how to ride a broomstick. Nanao is nervous about broom riding, and she mentions that she can ride a living creature, but she is not so sure about a broom. Oliver states that Nanao doesn't have to worry as broom are living creatures. The students then enter the broom house, and Nanao notices that the brooms really are alive. Dustin mentions that they are magical fauna, and they subsist off the elementals and magic particles that exist in the atmosphere, and the mana that they receive from the mages. In exchange they give them a ride, but every broom prefers a specific type of rider. Dustin mentions that they won't let them ride if they don't like them, so they should find the right partner for themselves. We then see that Oliver and Michaela have brought their own brooms, and we see that a lot of brooms are attracted to Nanao due to her high mana capacity. Nanao then notices a broom standing alone, and the teacher warns her that this is a bucking broom, and it might leave her black and blue if she is not careful. Nanao still approaches the broom, but the broom tries to avoid her. Nanao then states that her horse was also the same at first, and she mentions that she understands that the broom doesn't want anyone but its true master to ride it. She states that she won't force it to come with her, but she likes him the best out of all the others. The broom then accepts Nanao, and Nanao goes on a ride on him. Dustin then mentions that even he failed to tame that broom, and he thinks that Nanao is amazing. Oliver can't believe how good she is at riding the broom when it's just her first time, and Michaela mentions that normally even a veteran rider takes time to adjust to a new broom. Oliver then thinks that this is the same broom that her mother used to ride, and he can't believe that it chose Nanao. Afterwards, Nanao states that she had no idea that broom riding was so much fun, and she mentions that she is excited for the next class. Guy states that him and Pete had no luck, and he mentions that they should have Katie and Nanao show them the ropes. Pete states that he would rather study on his own, and the students then think that their alchemy class is next, and Katie states that they have been having a substitute teacher for a while, and she wonders what happened to Darius. Michaela mentions that she has heard that he went missing in the labyrinth, but it's hard to believe. Guy mentions that some people are saying that it was infighting among the teachers, or a mage with a grudge against Kimberly. Theodore then comes there, and he wonders what the truth is. Michaela is surprised to see that her father is back, and Theodore states that Michaela has gotten prettier since the last time he saw her. Michaela tells Theodore to not behave like this in public, and she wonders where he has been. Theodore states that he went to a lot of places, and he apologizes for making her worry. Michaela mentions that he should be apologizing to Nanao instead, and Theodore asks Nanao if she has been having fun. Nanao states that she has, and Michaela mentions that he shouldn't have disappeared on her after bringing her all the way from Asia, and Theodore mentions that he thought that it would work out with Michaela here to look after her. Theodore then states that Nanao seems to have made many friends, and he mentions that he would love to talk more, but he has a class to teach today. The scene then cuts to Theodore introducing himself to Michaela's class, and he mentions that he will be teaching them alchemy for the immediate future.
Theodore then asks everyone is anyone has read his book Journey to the East. Stacy states that she has read it up to volume 12, and Pete mentions that he has also read it. He states that he has a question, and he mentions that there is a part in volume 25 which differs from the original printing. Theodore wonders if Pete reads every volume, and Pete states that he reads them three times over. Theodore then asks Pete his name, and Pete introduces himself. Theodore mentions that he will be sure to bring Pete a present from his next trip to Asia, and Pete then starts to feel weird, and Oliver notices this. The scene then cuts to the student's first magic engineering class, and we see that their teacher is Enrico. Guy thinks that this one is even worse than the others, and Oliver states that Guy is right, and he asks them to not lose focus in his class. Enrico mentions that he will teach them the theory and skills they need to make magic tools and architecture, and he states that it's a fascinating subject, so they won't be bored. Enrico mentions that today they will start by dismantling finished products, and he gives the students four magic traps which are set to trigger in 60 minutes. He mentions that they are going to have big problems if they can't dismantle them in time, and he tells them to do their best if they don't want this to happen. Michaela thinks that Enrico isn't kidding around, and Oliver wonders if anyone here has done this before. He finds out that no one has done this before, and the scene then cuts to only one minute remaining. Michaela and Oliver has managed to dismantle three traps, but Oliver can't dismantle the last one in time, and he tells everyone to get away from the box. Pete trips while trying to get away, and some snakes then come out of the trap, and Oliver saves Pete. Guy states that he wouldn't be so scared if he knew that it would only be snakes, and he deals with the snakes by using a lightning spell. He mentions that he can deal with the snakes by splashing water on himself and running electricity over the surface of his body when the snakes bite him. Enrico then commends the students on a job well done, and he gives them all some lollipop. He mentions that this also functions as an antidote, and Katie tries to give the teacher a piece of her mind for teaching in a way which puts the students in danger, but Michaela stops her saying that this is how things are in Kimberly. Pete then thanks Oliver for saving him, and Oliver states that he needs to talk to Pete privately about how he has changed. The scene then cuts to Oliver asking Pete if he has switched sexes, and Pete states that he had a dream, and when he woke up, he was like this. Oliver then mentions that Pete has something which makes him rare even in the world of magic, and he mentions that Pete is a reversi, someone who goes back and forth between two sexes. He congratulates Pete, and he mentions that it's a gift for a magic user to be born this way. Oliver then asks Pete to try shooting a lightning spell as he is not good at those, and Pete fires a lightning spell and he notices that he has gotten better at it. Oliver then explains that he has heard that in a reversi male and female sides have different elements that they are good with. Oliver states that Pete has something incredible, and they should think about how to make good use of that. Oliver then notices that someone is here, and Carlos reveals herself. She mentions that she didn't mean to overhear, and she states that she has felt what was going on with Pete ever since she met her, but she became even more certain of it when she saw him today. She mentions that Oliver has already told him most of what she intended to, and if he wants to know more then he should come to this gathering at 8 p.m. tonight. The scene then cuts to Oliver and Pete going to the gathering, and they meet President Alvin on their way, and he accompanies them to the gathering. On their way Alvin explains that he does regular checks on the events that are held in the labyrinth, and he apologizes for not being able to stop what Vera did. Alvin then mentions that he knows that this place is dangerous, and he has been trying to change it for the last five years, but he has had no luck. They then arrive at the venue of the event, and Alvin mentions that this is a gathering for people with sex-based magical traits. Pete and Oliver then meet some people there, and Carlos then thanks everyone for coming to this event, and she mentions that here they can open up about everything. She states that they should enjoy the show first, and Carlos starts to sing with Gwen playing the violin. Oliver notices that she is using enchanted voice, but it's not some kind of charm ability, it's a song to give strength to others. Oliver then wonders if Pete wants a separate room, and Pete states that he can't spend the night alone in Kimberly, so he will be staying with Oliver for now, but he will be putting a curtain between their beds. The story continues, and Oliver and his friends watch some people playing broom sports, and Nanao thinks that it's like a battlefield out there. Michaela states that there are many types of broom sports, but the ones with teams are the most popular, and Nana thinks that this is quite a sight to behold. Michaela then mentions that Nana would be great at broom sports, and a man then comes there, and he states that they seem like good friends. 
Oliver wonders who he is, and the guy introduces himself as Tulio Rossi, a first year. He states that they don't have to tell him their names, as he already knows them, and he leaves telling Pete that they will be crossing paths again soon. The scene then cuts to Oliver having a mock battle with someone, and he wins the mock battle. Luther then summons Pete and Tulio for their mock battle, and Katie thinks that Pete seems a little too tense. The mock battle begins, and Tulio manages to defeat Pete easily. Luther then states that Pete was careless, and he mentions that Pete shouldn't rush things. Tulio then calls Pete a princess, and he wonders how long he is going to be protected by his friends. He states that Pete won't get any stronger that way, and the scene then cuts to Pete asking his friends to help him get stronger, as he can't do it on his own. Oliver mentions that they will help him, and Michaela states that she will make him a master of Rizet style swordsmanship. Oliver states that he should study Lanoff's style, and they then start bickering over which style is better, and Guy tells Nanao that this is one of the three greatest debates of the magic world. Katie then mentions that they should both teach Pete, and she states that Oliver can teach him defense, and Michaela can teach him offense. Oliver and Michaela think that this should work out as long as they discuss what they are going to teach ahead of time, and Oliver states that they are going to teach Pete how to win in a magical battle. Oliver then asks Pete what he is going to do to attack an enemy at close range, and Pete states that he will use his sword. He then asks about long range, and Pete mentions that he will use his spells. Oliver then asks him about mid-range, and Pete gets confused. Oliver then asks Pete to try attacking him at mid-range, and Pete tries to use a spell, but Oliver stops him with his sword. Oliver then states that being better at swordsmanship and magic are two ways to win, but there is also a third way, and it's being better at judging the distance between them and their opponents. We see that Tulio is watching this, and afterwards at the cafeteria Pete thinks about what Oliver told him just now, and Tulio then comes there. He states that he knows of a faster way to make Pete stronger, and he wonders if Pete would like to learn from him. Michaela then mentions that she doesn't appreciate Tulio barging in on their conversation, and Tulio states that Michaela shouldn't be like that as their group gets all the attention while the rest of them get left out. He mentions that he also wants to join in on the fun, and he asks the others if they also feel the same way. Oliver then asks Tulio what he is trying to say, and Tulio mentions that he thinks that it's about time they found out who the strongest first year is. He states that everyone should be given a chance to prove their strength, and he wonders who wants to join in on the fun. Stacy states that she will, and Faye asks her if she is sure, as she was shaking when the Garuda attacked. Stacy mentions that she is sure, and Faye states that he will also join as he doesn't trust her to do this on her own. Tulio asks who else wants to join, and Oliver, Naneo, and Michaela join as well with a few other of their classmates. Tulio mentions that the winner will be the one who gets the most medals, and he states that they will have to give a medal to the winner if they lose a duel, and they will be out if they lose all their medals. He mentions that the four with the most medals at the end of the week will fight in the final, and he states that they can challenge each other at any time. A girl named Odette then challenges Nanao to a duel, and the other students then thinks that Odette has a bad aim and lazy visualization, but she fires fast. Odette then state that it would be her honor to fight an Asian samurai, and the scene cuts to her fighting Nanao. Odette thinks that Nanao knows nothing about magic, and she should be fine as long as she can keep her distance. Katie then asks Oliver what he thinks of this duel, and Oliver states that Nanao is not good with magic, but this doesn't mean she has a disadvantage as she is a great fighter. The duel then begins, and Odette attacks Nanao with magic, but Nanao deflects the attack, and she defeats Odette. Oliver then states that Nanao's skills are on a whole other level, and Michaela then tells Nanao and Oliver that she is going to make it to the finals, and she wants them to do the same, so that they can battle each other. Michaela thinks that it's been a long time since she has been this excited, and the scene then cuts to Pete training with Oliver. Oliver states that Pete has been learning really fast, and he is starting to get the hang of judging distances. Oliver then asks Pete if he is okay, and Pete states that he is just a bit tired, and he mentions he will head back now. Oliver then notices Teresa there, and she states that Shannon and Gwen have invited Oliver for tea. The scene then cuts to Oliver in the labyrinth, and he meets Ophelia there. He tries to take out his weapon, but Ophelia tells him to calm down, as she is not in the mood right now. Ophelia states that Oliver has resistance to her perfume, and she asks him to sit down as she wants to talk to someone. Oliver then asks Ophelia if she has been in this labyrinth this whole time, 
and Ophelia states that she has returned to the school on several occasions. Ophelia then states that Oliver and his friends are standing out a lot, and she wonders how it felt to defeat the Garuda. Oliver states that he never wants to go through that ever again, and Ophelia mentions that she once heard Alvin say the same thing. She states that Alvin is quite fond of Oliver, as they are a lot alike, especially their habit of going on adventures that first years are far too immature for. She states that Carlos and she would go with Alvin on his adventures all the time when they were first years, and Ophelia wonders if Oliver knows Carlos. Oliver thinks that Carlos is a good person who cares about others, and Ophelia warns Oliver to be careful of her as she does like to meddle a lot in other people's business. Ophelia then thanks Oliver for having this talk with her, and she tells him to not go on too many adventures, and stay in the school building for the next few months, and she leaves. The scene then cuts to Oliver meeting Shannon and Gwen, and he states that he saw Gwen at an unusual place last time. Gwen mentions that him and Carlos have a long history, and he tells Oliver to think of this place as his own home, and here he can relax and train as he likes. Oliver then mentions that he met Ophelia in the labyrinth just now, and Shannon wonders where. Oliver states that she already left, and Gwen tells Shannon that it's too late to catch her now. Gwen then mentions that Ophelia is dangerous, but her and Shannon have known each other for a long time. Oliver can't believe this, and Gwen then asks Oliver if Nanao really used a seventh spellblade. Oliver states that he is not sure, but he did get the intuition that she did. Gwen mentions that Nanao is just like Oliver's mother, and Oliver states that he sometimes finds himself drawn to her. Gwen mentions that Oliver should leave the feelings he can't express in his own heart, and he mentions that Oliver should be himself and be loyal to his friend in his own way. Oliver states that Gwen is right, and he leaves. The scene then cuts to Oliver noticing that Tulio is following him, and he wonders if he has done something to make Tulio hate him. Tulio states that he hasn't, and he mentions that he just doesn't like Oliver getting more attention than him. Tulio then asks Oliver to fight him, and he states that they will know which of them is stronger when this fight is over. He states that they won't use any magic besides anti-lethality spells, and they will keep them at half the strength. Oliver agrees, and the fight begins, and Tulio uses a cheap move to take Oliver by surprise. The two of them then cross swords, and Tulio keeps on fighting dirty, and he steps on Oliver's feet and hits Oliver with his hands. He lands some solid hits on Oliver, and Oliver states that this has made him realize how inexperienced he really is. Tulio mentions that he has more to show Oliver, and Oliver then states that he is going to end this fight in the next eight moves. Oliver and Tulio then continue their fight, and they cross swords, and Oliver puts Tulio in an arm bind, and he states that he won't be beaten by a few dirty moves, as he has spent several years honing his techniques. Tulio then manages to release himself, and Oliver unarms Tulio with his next attack, and he states that it took only eight moves like he said. Tulio then gives Oliver his medal, and he thinks that losing to the person he wanted to beat the most is a shitty way to start this. Tulio then tells Oliver to get out of his sight, and Oliver states that Tulio has a unique way of fighting, but he is going to reach his limits soon at this rate. He advises Tulio to start learning one of the basic styles to avoid this, and Tulio wonders what's Oliver's deal. Oliver states that he is just jealous of the specific talent that Tulio has, and he mentions that nothing he did in that fight is the product of his own talent. He mentions that nothing he has is truly his, it was given to him by someone else, and that this is why he wants Tulio to nurture his talent. Oliver then leaves, and he meets Teresa. Teresa states that she is in awe after seeing that battle, and Oliver mentions that there was nothing to be proud of in that victory. Teresa states that Oliver wouldn't even let Tulio touch him if he was fighting the same way he did that night, and she mentions that the sheath named Kindness can sometimes dull a person's shine. She states that she is willing to die by Oliver's hands if this will help him get back his shine, and Oliver states that Teresa's face is red. Teresa gets embarrassed hearing this, and Oliver mentions that he is not going to use her and throw her away. This makes her even more embarrassed, and she runs away. Meanwhile in the labyrinth Tulio encounters another student, and he states that he is going to take that medal off of Tulio's hands. The story continues, and Oliver returns to his room, and he notices that Pete is breathing heavily. He asks Pete if he is okay, and the scene cuts to Oliver healing Pete, and he mentions that he will be sending his mana inside Pete to adjust the flow of mana within his body. He states that this should help him, and he mentions that Pete's body must still not be used to handling magic in its female form. 
He states that Pete needs to learn how to direct the flow of magic, and Pete wonders if Oliver has done this before. Oliver states that he has, and he then finishes the treatment, and he asks Pete how he feels. Pete states that his pain is gone, and Oliver mentions that this will keep happening until Pete's body gets used to the change. He states that he will be sleeping next to Pete so Pete can call on him if he needs him. Pete then mentions that they should get to bed as they have to wake up early tomorrow, and Oliver states that it's going to be hard for Pete to keep the secret from everybody for much longer. The scene then cuts to Pete telling everyone that he is a reversi, and everyone thinks that this is incredible, and they congratulate Pete. Pete mentions that he is not sure if congratulations is the right word as he has no idea how to use this, and Michaela mentions that she will give Pete something that he can use right away. Michaela then states that Pete has gained an extra organ which comes with the female body, and she states that it's the womb. She mentions that a womb is sometimes called a witch's second heart, and it is one of the best places to store mana. Michaela explains that the womb will open on its own when the mana from the rest of the body runs out, and Pete can also learn to open and close it with training. She states that she will show Pete how to open it, and Michaela opens Pete's womb. Pete then feels a surge in his magic power, and Michaela mentions that this can increase a person's magic output by several dozen percent. Michaela then closes Pete's womb, and she mentions that this is the advantage of having a female form. Nanao then wonders if she can also do that, and Katie then asks Pete if he is interested in lacy clothes. She mentions that they should get Pete to try on a bunch of outfits, and Tulio then comes there, and he states that they seem to be having fun. He asks them to not be tense as he is just here to complain, and he mentions that he has been on a losing streak ever since his fight with Oliver. He states that he will forfeit, and Oliver wonders if Tulio fought someone else after their battle. Tulio then tells Oliver to take care as some of these guys are bad news, and he wonders if Pete got any stronger than the last time they met. The scene then cuts to the students attending Luther's class, and Pete has a mock battle against Stacy. Stacy states that Pete will pay for humiliating her earlier, and Luther mentions that the two of them should keep fighting until the time is up even after they score a point. The fight then begins, and Stacy takes Pete down easily. Pete gets up, and Stacy takes him down again. Pete then tries to use magic, but he is still no match for Stacy, and Stacy then mentions that Pete shouldn't get full of himself just because he got a little bit of attention, and she gets mad at him for embarrassing her in front of her uncle, Theodore. Katie then states that she can't bear to watch this, and Oliver mentions that Pete hasn't given up, and he states that Pete can get an opening as Stacy underestimates him. Stacy then attacks Pete with magic, but Pete dodges the attack, and he goes for a hit, but the time is up before he could land the hit. Oliver and the others then state that Pete did great, and Pete cries at not being able to land even a single hit. Stacy then asks Michaela if she is the one who taught Pete that move, and she can't believe that Michaela is willing to go that far just to humiliate her. Tulio then states that Pete lost just like he predicted, but he has improved from the last time they met. The scene then cuts to Katie talking with the troll, and she receives a letter from a familiar. Afterwards, Katie tells everyone that Vera wrote to her, and in her letter, she told her that she can have her old workshop, and she mentions that it's her way of apologizing. She states that this is the only way for a first year to get a workshop, and Michaela mentions that the risks of entering the labyrinth outweighs the benefits of having their own workshop. Oliver states that he also thinks that it's too soon, and Katie mentions that the demi-humans are being killed at a staggering rate in this academy and the way they treat magical fauna here is terrible. They kill them for nothing, and she wants to change that. She wants to make a name for herself as a researcher, and for that she will need a place where she can raise magical fauna. Oliver wonders if this is why she wants a workshop, and Katie states that it is, and she mentions that she can't do this on her own, and this is why she needs all of their help. Hearing this everyone states that they will help Katie out, and Oliver states that the safety of everyone in this group comes first, and if they can promise him to stick to that, then he has no problems with it. He mentions that they should inspect the place first, and he states that they can head to the labyrinth on their weekends. The scene then cuts to the group in the labyrinth in the weekend, and everyone notices that Nanao has also brought her broom with her. Nanao mentions that she wants to spend as much time as she can with it, and Guy states that they should make sure that they are on the right path as he doesn't want to get lost here. Katie states that they should be fine as long as they are together and Oliver mentions that there are many scary things in the dungeon. 
He states that they can fall into traps and get dragged into fights with nasty upperclassmen, and Katie then notices a nest of ball mice. They then venture ahead in the dungeon, and they come across many different types of magical fauna. Guy then states that there seems to be a lot of magical fauna in this route, and he wonders if Katie chose this route deliberately. Katie states that the place ahead is a little dangerous, and she shows them that it's filled with bow shells. Katie states that the bow shells aren't big enough to kill them but they will hurt like hell, and Pete wonders how they can get through this. Katie then uses a special incense to make the bow shells go to sleep, and Nanao then senses something coming from behind them. Katie states that the bow shells are still not asleep, but they have to run as they don't have enough time. They manage to cross over to the other side, but Guy's ass gets pierced by some of the spikes. Nanao then states that she can smell something fragrant, and they follow the smell, and they find some students having a barbecue. They wonder what this is, and one of the students mentions that this is the gourmet club's first year welcoming barbecue. He wonders if they want to join in on the fun, and seeing the unusual cuisines in the barbecue Oliver and his friends refuse to join them. Afterwards Pete wonders who those weirdos were, and Guy states that they are famous. Michaela mentions that the one who invited them to join is especially famous, and she states that his name is Kevin Walker. Guy then states that he should have talked with him more, and Katie wonders if he is a big deal. Michaela states that he is, as he went missing in the labyrinth for six months, and he then came back alive when they'd already had his funeral. Guy then states that maybe they should have taken them up on that barbecue offer, and Katie wonders what a barbecue is. Guy states that they should have won if Katie has never been to one, and he wonders where they can get the ingredients. They then come across a student selling ingredients for barbecue, and she wonders what she can get for them. Oliver states that they would prefer something that tastes good, and the student then prepares some ingredients for them. She states that she will give them a discount since it's their first time here, and she also throws in some drinks with the ingredients. Later the group arrives at the workshop, and Katie uses her magic to open its gate. Everyone then checks out the workshop, and they think that it's really nice. They can't believe that they get to use all of this, and Katie mentions that this is one of the better workshops on the first level of the labyrinth. Michaela states that they can start using this immediately, and Katie mentions that everyone should first list the things that they want to use this workshop for. Oliver states that he will be mainly using it as a base to search the labyrinth for now, and he mentions that he might also use it as a safe house. Guy then states that a base needs to have a good defense so they should put some traps around it, and the group that has a barbecue. They think that it was really good, and Katie asks Michaela is it was not to her liking, and Michaela states that it was so much fun to eat that it felt strange. She states that she has never felt like this before, and she mentions that they should name their group something to commemorate this moment. They all then think about an idea for a good name, and Nano then tells everyone to draw their swords, make a circle, and hold out their swords straight. The swords then overlap, and Nano states that they call this a sword rose in their homeland. She mentions that it symbolizes the bonds between warriors, and she states that she wishes to name their group the Sword Roses. Oliver thinks that it's a good name, and everyone agrees with him. Michaela states that flowers bloom without the fear of dying, and they should strive to be the same. Katie then asks Michaela if this is what she wanted, and Michaela states that it is, and she mentions that they will be known as the Sword Roses from now on. Elsewhere Stacy defeats a participant of the battle to decide the best first year, and Faye tells her that he has heard that Michaela and her friends are in the labyrinth, and Stacy thinks that this is perfect. The story continues, and everyone states that they had a wonderful night, and Guy mentions that the credit of all this goes to Katie. They all then notice that Katie is already asleep and they think that they should, should sleep as well as they have a big day ahead of them. Elsewhere Stacy thinks that she is going to prove to Michaela that she is not her replacement, and we see that someone is following her. The scene then cuts to Oliver training Nanao in the workshop in the morning, and he asks Nanao if she has been able to do that attack she used against Vera ever since then. Nanao states that she hasn't been able to do it, and Oliver mentions that it's not something that a person can do on a fluke. He then states that they should practice spellcraft for now, and Nana wonders if they can spar with their swords first. Oliver states that it's too soon for that as she needs to master her spells first, and he mentions that his job is to get her to the point where she can combine her spellcraft with her swordsmanship. When she gets there, she will become his equal, and Nana thinks that this sounds interesting. 
Before they begin, they hear guys scream, and they go out to check, and they find out that the troll is here. Michaela wonders if Katie went out of the labyrinth on her own to bring it here, and Katie states that she only met the troll halfway inside the labyrinth. Oliver wonders if the troll came on his own, and Vera states that she was the one who brought it here. She mentions that she only helped a little as it would be hard for a first year to bring it here. The scene then changes to Pete waking up, and he searches for his glasses, and a hand gives it to him, and Pete freaks out seeing the hand. Vera then explains that this is the hand that Nanao cut off, and she turned it into a pseudo life form, and it's called Milligan's hand, or Millahand for short. The scene then cuts to everyone having some tea, and Michaela wonders why Vera gave Katie this workshop. Vera mentions that it's just an investment in her future potential, and she states that she just wants to share in her gains in the future. She mentions that this is the only place where Katie can take care of the troll herself, and Katie states that she has wanted to look after him for a long time, and the troll states that he likes being with Katie. Katie tells everyone to call the troll Marco, and Oliver wonders if Marco knows who he is. Marco states that he does, and he mentions that Katie talks a lot about Oliver. We then see that Marco also knows the rest of the group, and he mentions that they are also his friends as they are Katie's friends. Oliver states that this is right, and he mentions that they are all friends. Vera then shows the group the shortest route to the workshop, and Guy can't believe that they could have come here directly if they took this route. Vera mentions that being able to come this deep in the labyrinth was the minimum requirement for her to give them this workshop, and she states that they passed, and she then leaves. Katie then states that they should begin their second day of search now that they know their way back, and the scene cuts to them continuing their search. While going forward Michaela tells everyone to stop, and she mentions that they will enter the second layer of the labyrinth if they keep going forward. She mentions that the second layer is more complex, and bigger than the first, and it is called the bustling forest. Guy and Pete can't believe that there is a forest inside the labyrinth, and Michaela states that they should turn around. Stacy then comes there, and she mentions that they have been waiting for Michaela, and she asks her to hand over her coin. Marco tries to attack Stacy, but Katie stops him, and she mentions that this tournament doesn't allow familiars. Faye then tells Stacy to calm down, and she asks Michaela if they want to have a two-on-two -two with them. Nanao states that this sounds fun, and Oliver then states that the two of them might display a high level of teamwork if they have known each other for long. Michaela states that it seems exciting to pit their six months together with all of their years, and she then gets ready to fight with Nanao. The man following Stacy then states that they should make this a three-on-three, -three, and Michaela can't believe that Joseph Albright is also participating in this tournament. Oliver then explains that the Albrights are known for excelling in combat, and Stacy then wonders if Joseph wants to team up with them. Joseph states that he is also fine with a free-for-all if they don't want to team up, and he wonders if the Michaela and the others agree with this, and he refers to Oliver a typical nobody. Oliver then states that they will accept this fight, and Stacy tries to stop Joseph, but Faye mentions that this works in their favor as he is after Nanao. Joseph then mentions that he will take them to the battlefield, and Michaela wonders if they will fight on the second layer. She states that they can't go there, as they have other students here, and Joseph mentions that they should send the others home. The others then mention that they won't leave until they see Joseph getting his ass kicked, and Marco states that he will protect them all so Michaela doesn't have to worry. The scene then cuts to everyone on the second layer of the labyrinth, and Katie thinks that it doesn't look like they are underground. They then arrive at the battlefield, and Joseph states that they should keep the anti-lethality spell to half the strength, and they then line up for the duel. The duel begins, and Oliver attacks Joseph. Stacy then states that Joseph was supposed to fight Nanao, and Faye mentions that he didn't expect Horn to go after him. Michaela then faces off against Stacy, and she mentions that it's been too long since they last fought. Stacy states that she doesn't want to talk to her, and Michaela mentions that Stacy does hate her a lot. They then cross swords, and Nanao thinks that they are having a great battle. Faye then mentions that he will have to apologize to her as their battle is not going to be that exciting, and he then uses a fire spell to make a smokescreen, and he runs away. Nanao chases after him, and Oliver and Joseph then face off with a fire and water spell. Oliver then tries to attack Joseph, but he misses, and Joseph mentions that Oliver is just a nobody like he thought. He states that Oliver is just using his footwork to throw him off guard, and Oliver mentions that Joseph should save the talk for after he has managed to win. 
Oliver then thinks of a strategy when Joseph tries to attack him, and Joseph does the same thing to Oliver rendering his strategy unusable. Oliver can't believe that Joseph noticed what he was doing, and countered his attack, and Joseph mentions that Oliver is just doing what he learned in his textbooks. He mentions that Rossi was also a nobody but he had more potential, and Oliver then charges at Joseph, and he manages to scar his face by overpowering him. Oliver then explains that this was the move called heavy feather, and it's a type of gravity control that affects their own body. He mentions that this is also a textbook attack, and he wonders what Joseph thinks about this. Joseph then states that he will make Oliver pay for this, and the scene then changes to Nanao catching up to Faye. Stacy then intervenes in their fight, and she asks Faye what he is doing. Faye mentions that Nanao is harder to deal with than he thought, and Stacy then asks him if Faye is willing to bring her victory at any cost. Faye then remembers the time when he first met Stacy, and we see that Stacy's father was going to kill Faye as he was just a stray puppy who had lost his parents, but Stacy protected him, and she told her father that she wants to take him as a servant. Back to the present Faye mentions that Stacy has been her owner, and he won't hesitate to do what she asks. Stacy then creates artificial moonlight, and basking in it makes Faye transform into a werewolf. Stacy then mounts onto Faye, and they both try to attack Michaela. Michaela dodges and Nanao attack Faye, but the attack has no effect. Michaela mentions that this blow would have knocked out a normal person, but Faye is a werewolf, and his ability to take hits is on a whole different level. They all then attack and defend against each other, and Stacy states that she is going to surpass Michaela, and she is sure that after she does so, her uncle is going to accept her. Meanwhile Oliver and Joseph are crossing swords, and Joseph asks Oliver if he is not going to help his friends, and he states that he wouldn't mind if Oliver uses this as an excuse to run away. Oliver states that his friends don't need his help, and he mentions that there is no reason for him to flee from this fight. Michaela then mentions that she is in awe of Stacy's resolve to do whatever it takes to win, and she warns her that she needs to have Faye transform back immediately. She mentions that Faye mustn't be a pure-blooded werewolf if he was allowed to enter the academy, and half-werewolf are known to suffer incredible pain when they transform. She mentions that he must be feeling an unbelievable amount of pain this very moment, and she wonders why Stacy would make her own partner suffer like this for a duel between first-year students. Stacy then remembers the past, and in her memory, she asks Flay why her father never praises her. She wonders if it's because she is not his real daughter, and she mentions that she will get her father back from the others one day. Flay states that she will, and returning to the present Stacy states that Michaela can't understand her, as she has always had everything. They then continue their fight, and Stacy attacks Michaela. Nanao parries the attack, and she mentions that Stacy and Faye are prepared to put everything they are worth in this battle, and it would be rude of them if they don't meet them with the same resolve. Michaela states that Nanao is right, and she mentions that she won't tell Stacy to halt the transformation anymore, but she promises to her that Faye's pain won't last long. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching part 10. 10. The rest, the rest of, of the parts, parts will be on my channel. channel. Please, Please like and share, share the video, video if you enjoyed, enjoyed it, and make, and make sure, sure to hit the subscribe button, button and, turn and turn on the, on the notification, notification bell to keep getting new anime, anime recap updates. updates.